people here in, in Zoom? Yes, we can. Yeah, we got you. Okay, this way. Let me turn that speaker on. I can too. Oh, so it's coming from the computer. We have a Oh, the just uh, lower the volume. This. No, we should be fine. Okay, sorry about that. Well, hello everyone, people in Zoom. We're gonna have the graduate mining series. It's gonna be the student presentations. And first we're gonna have Alejandro Delgado Jimenez and his presentations about the application of the sustainable livelihood framework to artisanal and small scale mining. Uh, we'll jump at the presentations to make time for everyone. I cannot hear again. This is the overview of this presentation, which is focused on defining the artisanal and small scale mining or defining some characteristics of the this activity, uh, the sustainable livelihood framework to study cases and how we are applying the sustainable livelihood framework to the ASF. Artisanal and small scale mining is a critical livelihood strategy for rural communities. There are some suggestions about the numbers of people involved in this activity. There are about 45 million people across 80 countries working directly in the ASM and around 134 uh, million people obtain their livelihood from ASM related industries. As a result of this relevance in the rural areas, ASM create indirect employment and direct cash injections and uh, produces around 20% of the gold in the world. However, ASM faces structural challenges such as political disputes, policies, technical assistance, barriers to entry, access to financial services uh, and markets, vulnerability to illegal groups. Let's talk now about the Sustainable Livelihood Framework, SLF. This framework has some considerations. First, that people operate in a context of vulnerability. Second, that within this context, people have access to certain assets or capitals. However, these assets or capitals are subject to a institutional or organizational environment in order to get a meaning or a value. And this environment the organizational and institutional environment also influences how people meet their own livelihood objectives. This is a representation of this framework, which basically relates uh, five livelihood capitals represented by the Pentagon, uh, the transformative structures and processes, or also now uh, known as the PIPs, and in the left, the vulnerability context, 
we focus on these three concepts to understand how the ASM could be a sustainable livelihood. Two concepts are very relevant for this uh, research. The first one are capitals, which are defined as a set of both tangible and intangible resources or stocks that individual possess or assets. Also, that capitals may be accumulated, combined or transformed into other forms of capital, but also they could be depleted. This is very important for the rural communities and the rural ASM activities. The second concept is the concept of institutions. They are defined as uh, arrangements that provide the rules of the game, uh, that the structures, incentives and constraints options, but also that reduce uncertainty. Institutions structure social interactions and connect people with livelihood assets, but also influences access to opportunities and choices. With these concepts, some characteristics of the ASM, the Sustainable Livelihood Framework, and the concepts of capitals and the concept of institutions, let's move now to, to the two case studies that uh, we developed in this research. Both cases are located in Colombia. Colombia is in the north of South America. And these uh, places or the places where these study cases took uh, place are located in the mid cauca belt terrain. The first case is Marmato, a place with 500 years of mining history, where about 4,000 people work directly in mining activities. If it could be in medium mining or artisanal mining in the upper part of the mountain. This was a place with a prospect for open pit mining in the upper part of the mountain, which derived in a latent conflict, which still is in development in the place. But also there are latent risks for communities, for the environment and the infrastructure as a result of the accumulated uh, impacts uh, due to the ASM activities. These two images shows uh, a close up of how this looks and how people perform these activities in the upper part of the mountain. The approach for this case was centered on the analysis and the use of the five capitals by ASA miners. Following the sustainable livelihood frameworks, we concluded some remarkable things that are important for the ASM sector. The first thing is that miners have certain capitals that they use strategically to, for example, buffer the impacts of the vulnerability context or to uh, overcome the barriers imposed by the institutional context. We also concluded that human and so social and financial capitals are supported through the development of ASM activities. However, the natural and physical capitals are depleted as a, co as a consequence of the development of ASM activities. From this case and the application of the SLF, we propose a bottom-up approach for writing the formulation of policies to promote development in the sector, which consists of four uh, elements. The first one is identify what constitutes the five forms of capitals for the communities we are approaching. The second is to understand how the capitals are mobilized and how they interact. The third is to analyze capitals potentials for mitigating, copying or building resilience within the vulnerability context. And finally, to assess the interactions with the policies, institutions, and processes. We put together these four elements and propose them as a bottom-up approach 
for managing ASM activities or ASM interactions. The second study case is located in Buritica. It's a town historically affected by the Colombian inner conflict. And as a result of this inner conflict, it's among the poorest towns in Colombia. There was weak or absent presence of regional and national government agencies. And the economy before the mining project was based mainly in small farms, in small farms, small cattle raising activities, and some jobs provided by the local major uh, office. These are two illustrations uh, regarding in the left side, the town in the mountains of the Andes, and in the right side, the projected uh, or an illustration of the project. The evolution of this project is as follows. The project started exploration in 2008. Uh, before the exploration activities, there was a small scale mining who produces just enough to maintain the operation. Uh, but after the exploration, there was a feasibility study in 2016. Uh, in parallel with the exploration process, the town and the project experienced an ASM influx between 2012 and 2016. Uh, and it created a social and environmental crisis which uh, were associated mainly with the ASM influx. As a response to this crisis, there was uh, designed and deployed a multi-agency operation to recover the governance at the site, which happened between 2016 and 2020. The operation was successful However, in 2020, the project changed the ownership and nowadays there is a governance crisis again. However, I would like to do two notes here. First is that our study case focuses on the 2016-2020 period and the formalization project positive outcomes, but also that these governance crisis help us to understand the implications and the importance of the field work with social professionals and the con and the constant interaction with communities in order to gain uh, access and to maintain the governance to the site these are two pictures they are not in the same moment just uh, to illustrate the differences among, among the operation modes. In the left hand, you can see an illegal operation, small scale illegal operations that happened between 2012 and 2016. In the right hand picture, you can see how the project was constructed and this picture is from around 2019. These are construct, con, contrasting scenarios and I don't want to conclude nor suggest any uh, conclusion about which one is better or not. I'm just giving you some images to contrast what happened there. Some remarks from this uh, study case. Uh, it was a response, the, the formalization process was a response to social and environmental crisis, but also a response to the licensing pro process to the, with the regulators. And as a result, the ASM miners transitioned uh, through small scale operators. It was a program designed and implemented through a strategic model, a set of policies, and uh, an operative model, which can be interpreted as a 
institutional arrangement, and it was a strategy to mine marginal resources which was not accessible with the large scale technologies. From this case, we put together two elements the characteristics of, of institutions, which are the rules adoptions, the constraint and incentives, and the uncertainty reduction. But also, we learn that a formalization process with ASM miners required essential requirements to start, core conditions to emerge, and a substrate to work, to grow. From this uh, study case, we understand uh, the barriers in the sector and the needed or and the need to provide ASM miners with capabilities to adopt rules, adapt the constraints and fulfill conditions to get incentives and reduce uncertainties to contractual agreements, but also to understand what can help formal, formal operators to start, thrive and grow as, an, as entrepreneurs. With this research, we now can respond and address to this main question. Given the social, economic, environmental and policy context in which ASM activities are developed, what combination and forms of capital can result in the ability to develop formal ASM activities and contribute to the development of rural areas where these activities take place. I have put together this uh, dissertation in this table and the approach we are taking in order to address the SLF and the ASM. Marmato was focused in the access and mobilization of capitals for achieving an ASM-based livelihood and informed formalization, and it was a bottom-up approach. The Buritica was focused on understanding the transition between uh, artisanal and small-scale mode of operation to a formal small-scale operators, and it was a top-down approach. With the vulnerability, we want to approach actions on the vulnerability context uh, with governance mechanisms that are focusing the institutional environment and context to promote adaptive action and resilience, and resilience which is uh, how capitals can interact there. And we are expecting to work in a policy brief. With this, I finish my intervention, my brief presentation. Please do not hesitate if you have a, any question or you want to discuss with me any of the concepts, any of the concepts I give you here in this presentation. Thank you so much for your time and for your attention. so can I ask yes no um well he's not here so we Sorry, this was a recorded uh, presentation. So uh, for the question part, I guess you might have to postpone it to the end of the session because uh, he said you might be able to join us at the end of the session and answer some questions. Uh, I'm sorry for this. Okay, so then you go ahead. Thank you very much. You want to raise? Yeah, I can 
all on the trunks. So if we can use this not in the block. Okay. Hello everyone. Next we're gonna have Patty Arendt not blue integrated system dynamics modeling and optimization for artisanal and small scale coal supply chains. He's a PhD student on the mining department and research assistant and teaching assistant for the introduction of systems, engineering course, and graduate student government representative. So giving a welcome and let's start. Thank you very much, Santiago. Hello, everyone. So first of all, I just want to say for all amazing women who are here and who are listening to us, happy Women's Day. Uh, second of all, I just want you to imagine that you are miners. Okay, so how many of the people here in the room uh, don't know anything about gold mining? I think all of you know, right? So I want you to imagine that each one of you has a small scale mine, okay? And uh, this mine is working in Peru, and I will explain now why I'm asking this. So uh, thank, uh, thank to uh, Santiago. Uh, I am Fatih Alamoro, a PhD student at the Department of Mining Engineering. And today I will be presenting um, our second paper overview, which is integrating system dynamics modeling and optimization for formal small scale gold supply chains in Peru. I am supervised by Dr. Jeff Anderson, Dr. Tulai Flamand, and Dr. Nicole Smith. And thanks to Gerardo Martinez, who graduated last year, uh, for helping us also in our work. So let's get started. Well, uh, in Peru, the amount of gold that is exported is 15% higher than, than the amount that is the amount of gold production reported by the country itself. So this creates a question, creates questions how, how this can happen. It means that there are a lot of gold that is not reported, and there is a gap which is just 15%. So this gap usually comes from either uh, informal mining or like the formal mining that have informal activities, right? So even formal artisanal small-scale gold mines, and we call them SGM, have informal activities, such as the way they acquire, acquire mercury and the way they sell the gold. So to make this uh, more specific, we went to Amalia, which is a mining, it's a mining town or mining city. A lot of small scale mining happening there, but a lot of also non formal activities happening there. And this photo is for the suit for, you know, or uh, like or gold processing, uh, gravity processing in uh, one of the size cities. So, all mines in that region, there are a lot of small scale mines. All of them almost work. They use the same equipment, they process the same way, and they do almost identical processing. So we went to a mine of one of these mines, and we analyzed that, like we calculated one mine with one uh, one mine with one excavator, they produce 2.34 million tons of four yearly. They release 35.6 kilograms of mercury to the environment. Which is one of the main issues. And their recovery is too low. I believe all of you like, have an idea about the good recoveries of gold. This is 0 0.03 gram of gold we have done as recovery. Additionally, workers are exposed to mercury concentration that is 700 times the mercury limit exposure. And they work for 10 hours under this exposure. 
and some of them are attacked while they are transporting their gold to gold buyers. Thank you. Yeah, so when we went there, like we 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 saw a lot of problems. So like we were like asking ourselves, how can we eliminate mercury use in FDM? How can we reduce water use in coal production? Because they use water, water and processing, and the efficiency of water using is really low. They don't recycle. They melt the glaciers in the mountains and get the water from there and let it run out after processing. How can we increase the traceability of the gold produced? We want to reduce that 15 percent gallon. And how can the issues related to tailings be solved in SCM? Especially in that area, because like a um, few years ago, big uh, tailings that very occurred there. So a potential solution is okay. Don't process food in mercury. Let us provide you or some agency or you as miners build a central uh, processing plant using sanitation, right? This is a good way of recovering gold other than mercury. And the facility will buy the run of mine. All you need to do as miners, just send out your run of mine to the facility and the rest is on the facility itself. And the since such facility when it is built, it will be formalized, it will follow all guidance, it will process gold in an efficient way, the recovery will be high, you know, like sanitation can reduce up to 95% recovery as well, right? And how the facility would be paying the miners, like the, the amount of gold that is included in your run of mine, usually you get a you get a recovery of 30%. Okay, we may give you the money that is equivalent to 35% of the of the of the gold that is included and the rest. Is the profit of the uh, facility itself. So up to here, whatever like whatever I mentioned is already discussed a little bit in the literature regarding the NSGM and their problems. But we want to calculate that. We want to do some like is this really possible? If it is possible, how you as miners would be convinced to do such transition, right? So we went to the field to start our work, right? So we did well, first first thing we do is collecting data, right? So we did some literature review, explained a little bit about that, and we did the field work, we collected data from there, and then we did our or we built a system dynamics model. For the existing operation to simulate what is going on there. So after we built the simulation, you know, any simulation model needs validation. So we validated that model, that model and I explained that validation in one of the slides later. And then we introduced to the simulation the new potential solution, which is the central processing uh, plan, sanitation processing plan. And then we get the outputs of that, and we built an optimization model for how you as miners would you would do this transition in the most optimal way so that you get profit, all the problems that I mentioned would be solved, and everyone is happy. So this is the system dynamics model for the current operation. So I won't go into, into details, it's too complicated. So there are several flows, run of mine flow in blue, gas flow, money flow, and mercury flow. And when they use retort or when they don't use, I want to go with this to this leader. But the point here that this simulates what is, what is going on inside the mine, the intersection between different supply chains and different activities. Some of them are formal, some of them are informal, so they are really complicated with each other. After that, we needed to validate this model, right? So we took some very important, like that, some important metrics from that model. Those are coal production, coal production, and mercury. 
So the way we validated that minus that we were able to get the real minus records in their mind, right? And we keep that aside. We run our simulation, we got our results, and then we compare the records of miners of their production, well, production, mercury, everything, with what we, what we produce. And we got, we got really a good accuracy, and all of them are about 90%, which is a good representative representation of the reality somehow. So from the I'm good at am I good at time? Yeah. So from the um, simulation model, we got some uh, you know numbers from the existing operation, annual production, annual mercury consumption, and annual mining and processing costs, and annual profit, which is 2.8 million. It just keep this number in mind in mind, okay. Then, as I mentioned, after we did the simulation for the existing uh, operations, we added the additional simulation for the potential solution, which is the central time and data processing plan. And we make the simulation in a way that it simulates how likely miners, you guys, would be. Uh, doing this transition plan based on the payback percentage, like the amount of money that we will give you when you sell, when you sell up your uh, run, of, run of money as a uh, facility. And the way we, the way we obtain the results, we did 10 runs, 10 runs for um, payback percentages from 25 to 34%. And the reason why we, talk, we have chosen this, uh, this range is in the literature, in a similar configuration, um, more than 34 or more than 35 uh, payback percentage uh, is or can be considered as not profitable for the facility itself. So whenever we do any run, this is an example of one runs for 32% payback percentage the, the simulation gives that like miners would would be able or like would be willing to do this transitioning in that rate, the blue line. And additionally, they would start with uh, 78 tons for the first month and they would start increasing that until they would be selling all their production, which is uh, which which is that. Uh, straight line out there. And these are daily, but we converted them to monthly because the optimization model, model that I show now is basically uh, in monthly basis. Well, now we come to the problem statement of the optimization model. So we got these outputs that I'm showing now to put them in the optimization model to get the optimal transition plan. That would provide the maximum profit for you, for miners, right? So we go very quickly over that. We have four main um, numbers. A uh, run of mine that miners is penalized for, and I will explain that. Payback percentage selected by the model, monthly run of mine sold, and change in monthly run of mine sold. So let's assume that in the first month, miners would keep processing their own in uh, on site, then the model would, would suggest them getting 27 payback percentage. You will send, uh, you will start selling that amount, just 30,000 tons per month to the facility. And after that, since there is no change, 10 payback percentage. But if you increase the payback percentage, we increase the payback percentage, you should send us this amount, which is like increased by 68, and total will be 98, and so on. But if you decrease, like after we have the agreement that you are selling, selling us the run of mine, if you decrease your, uh, your amount for that is, uh, that's uh, brought to us, then you will get penalized. 
how you will get finalized as a facility, how much we will be gaining from that amount of run of mine. That is your loot. You should pay it to us. Then here comes the optimization model. We call it the transition plan problem, TPP. And the model basically provides transition plan for your maximum profits. It runs for 12 months period. And running it more than that would, uh, would increase the survey time. And 12 months is really good, which is one year. And it is like for maximizing miners' profit. Okay, so I'll go very quickly on the optimization model. Those are the decision variables that occur in the objective function. So for those who don't have bad amount of optimization, I think you all do have. We have decision variables, we have objective functions, we have parameters, we have constraints. So we want to maximize or minimize something based on our conditions and our constraints. So this is the objective function. I won't go again into details, but we can discuss that if you if you are interested later. So revenue, of course, when selling to the mine, when when selling to the facility, and revenue when you um, let's say uh, processing in the mine side. And the model is taking both, see which one is good for the miner to maximize the profit. And here are the, the constraints. Those cons constraints are really making sure that the conditions that I explained in the problem statement would be met. If you want to discuss those additionally in details, I'm happy to, to do that. And those are some parameters value that we get to the, to the model. For example, we got average load price as 58. The maximum total monthly production of the mine is 221,000 uh, tons per month, and so on. And here comes the optimal solution. So the model suggests to you, start sending your run of mine from month one and increasing that at month two until you reach all your, your run of mine as you are producing and selling it all to the facility. And this way you will increase your profits, your yearly profit by 22%. So it becomes three by four million. You remember that two by eight and your profit. Additionally, we will be solving all the mercury problems, scaling problems, and security problems and or water problems. So it's just like you can consider it when when uh, condition. And the water stored in two seconds, which is was meant to bring it to two seconds. And then we did some sensitivity analysis for some parameters. And here, as you can see, the green one is the gold price. According to the sensitivity, it shows that gold, like such case is really sensitive to gold price. And for fixed local recovery, it is not linear. The reason why it's not linear, I want to explain it. It, takes, it may take some time. So uh, it's, all of this will be in our paper that we are currently publishing. So once it will be published, we'll make sure that it will reach to all of you. Yeah, to conclude, to conclude we visited um, the mine. Uh, we saw observed the problems, uh, collected data, did some literature, provide the, the methodology, build system dynamics model, get the output the data, build the model, and at the end, yes, the uh, 22% more profit. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thanks. So for questions and everything, we'll do it at the end of this last presentation because we're running a bit tight on time and there's an exam <laughs> uh, following up this room. Uh, so we'll have Bouchour Guillaumont.
in optimal material handling equipment and selection using mixed integer linear and programming approach for gold mine in Turkey. Can I help you with anything? Or you just want to you. Okay. Right. Is this? Which one? Uh, yeah. Is that? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We can just read it. Okay. Oh, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why is it doing that? There we go. So I'm going to use this computer, right? Yeah. yeah. And you can click our space. Should be fine. Hi. No boy. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Burchamal. I'm a master's student in mining engineering department. So uh, today I'm going to present you my study on uh, optimal material handling equipment selection. Uh, using a missing digital linear programming algorithm uh, for a gold mine in Turkey. Uh, let me start with uh, the basics of a uh, mining cooperation. So, as you all know, the ultimate goal of a mining cooperation is to provide raw materials at the least expense. However, uh, as you all know, the ownership and operating costs of the material handling equipment. Uh, uh, comprised of the uh, a huge part of the total uh, mining uh, costs. Therefore, while selecting these uh, equipments, it's uh, really important to make sure that they are all compatible with the working environment and the other operating equipment. Uh, the purpose of our study uh, is to select a, a proper size of the material handling uh, equipment fleets and uh, matching them with the other compatible uh, trucks and excavators, uh, and uh, developing a linear uh, programming algorithm for the optimal uh, material handling fleet uh, selection and estimating their overall uh, capex and opex cost uh, over the entire life of the mine. And uh, this model allocates and schedules the optimal material handling fleet uh, in each period uh, to uh, meet the long term production plan and uh, set by the mine owner. Uh, and also, we created a rebuilding schedule uh, that determines the amount of equipment that needs to be uh, salvaged or re rebuilt uh, at the end of the, each mining period. Uh, also, uh, we performed a sensitivity analysis to determine the effect of variation in the parameters, uh, how, how much the uh, objective value will be affected. Yeah, with these rates of variations. Uh, let me introduce the case study. Uh, the mine that uh, we utilize in our uh, study is located on the northwestern uh, coast of Turkey, and the deposit is uh, formed from uh, polymetallic uh, uh, metals, and also uh, it's a uh, gold and silver mine. Uh, the remaining life of the mine is 12 years, uh, which starts from uh, 2023 to 2034, uh, and there is a tender process uh, uh, employed in the uh, by the mine owner uh, for the material handling operation, and 
Uh, as you can see in the picture, uh, right, uh, there's uh, the face mining method uh, is employed in the mine site uh, with using the small capacity uh, hole trucks and excavators. Uh, as uh, you can see, the excavator is sitting on top of a bench, and the bench heights are really uh, small compared to other uh, applications. The reason behind that is to improve the selectivity and uh, decrease the amount of dilution. Let me talk about the dump locations. There are five uh, dump locations in the uh, mine site for three different types of materials, uh, which can be listed as the non as generating rock uh, dump sites, uh, potential as generating rock dump site, leach pet, tailing storage facility, and mill. This picture shows the exact locations of these dump sites uh, on the topography. Now I want to talk about how we selected uh, or proposed these uh, off highway truck and excavator fleets. There are some operational parameters that needs to be considered uh, in the, the selection, uh, which are uh, the whole road width, uh, the number of passes or the total cycle time of excavators, uh, the load capacity of trucks and uh, also excavators, and, and Etc. Uh, there are uh, a lot of uh, parameters in these selections, and according to the preliminary uh, analysis, uh, we found out that the the maximum hole load width can be assumed as uh, 80 meters, uh, uh, and uh, in two-way straight roads, uh, the maximum uh, the largest truck width uh, should be uh, uh, approximately five meters. Uh, as you can see on the uh, table on the left side of the presentation, uh, we proposed uh, some uh, truck and excavator models. And in our model, we matched each uh, truck and excavator models with each other to observe how uh, these matches affect the uh, overall productivity of these different fleets. Uh, let me go on the next slide. Uh, now I want to talk about the model that we developed. Uh, the model is deterministic in uh, nature, and its objective is to minimize the total uh, ownership and operating cost of the uh, selected uh, optimal material handling fleet. And it accounts in multi-period, multi-location, and multi-commodity flow uh, requirements. And also, it considers the uh, rebuilding schedule of the uh, proposed equipment fleets. Uh, and uh, as I as we saw in the previous uh, slide, uh, it matches compatible uh, equipment fleets according to the operational parameters, and uh, it meets the long-term production uh, plan uh, that is set by the mine owner. Um, uh, with the uh, uh, decision values we utilize, uh, we determine the amount of. Uh, equipment needs to be purchased in each year, and we allocate these uh, equipment in each uh, side of the mine so uh, so that they can cover the annual uh, or the long-term production plan. Also, it calculates the uh, required operating hours or schedules for each pay, uh, piece of equipment. Let me quickly talk about the model uh, itself. Uh, as, we, as I uh, said before, uh, its uh, objective function is the minimization of the overall cost of the selected uh, ha material handling fleet. And uh, we employed uh, uh, several uh, constraints uh, to set the boundaries of the problem. Uh, let me talk about these constraints. Uh, the first one is the production demand constraint and uh, equipment matching constraints. Uh, number of trucks constraints uh, and also number of excavators constraints. We set the, also the initial uh, conditions constraints as uh, zero, as you can see, because in the in the beginning of the operation, we assume that the mine owner doesn't have any truck or excavator fleet. Uh, therefore, we set them as zero. And uh, also, uh, our model is uh, utilizes just one type of fleet throughout the life of the mine. 
uh, we set our uh, decision variables as you can see uh, as uh, on the uh, g uh, selecting the uh, person same type of fleet constraints and uh, other non-negativity constraints and now i want to talk about the results of our model implementation uh, we solved our model in uh, ample uh, grow uh, by using the calculated data set uh, we achieved the results in a uh, point uh, 125 uh, seconds and the optimal solution was achieved uh, for the given uh, for the fleet that gives the minimum uh, overall cost of the mining operation which is the same as the same as the uh, contractors contractors uh, on highway equipment fleet and the, it uh, it was found that the total over, overall cost of these operation for the whole mine life uh, 12 years including the operating cost uh, the truck rebuilds uh, and the uh, equipment uh, ownership cost is uh, 171 million dollars and uh, it uh, corresponds to 0.89 uh, dollar per ton uh, of material uh, handled uh, as i said uh, we developed the equipment rebuilding schedule uh, uh, according to the uh, mine owners uh, requirements so in, um, with this schedule uh, we determine which equipment uh, needs to uh, work in each period of the mine and uh, they can uh, either rebuild or salvage these equipments whenever they, whenever they need extra equipment or the equipment that are not in service and with this schedule uh, we achieved for on highway equipment uh, approximately three million dollars of savings uh, for the whole operation and uh, we conducted a sensitivity analysis uh, and uh, according to these sensitivity results uh, we found out that the, uh, the equipment available to rates has the most uh, effect on the overall net present value of the project we also have other uh, parameters that uh, we include in a sense of analysis, which are operating hours, inflation rate, and discount rate. Uh, we found out that the other parameters, which are like inflation rate and discount rate, uh, does not have uh, as much effect as the uh, availability on the uh, net present value of the project. Thank you very much for uh, listening to my uh, presentation. If you have any questions, um, okay, guys. So we can save questions for next seminar because there's an exam in this classroom. So we got to leave. Um, sorry about that. Had some technical problems. And thank you for coming. Well, grab some sandwiches on the way out if you want to. Well, we're just the host real quick.